Yeah. Okay, so we are sitting with uh, Ivar Amalde in uh, in Norway. Um, he is a hornball maker and he is a flight archery champion as well. Um, it's taken a little bit of time to get uh, a meeting with Ivar. He's a very busy guy um, making hornbows at the moment. Um, so Ivar, thank you for taking the time out to sit with me. Sure, sure, of course. Excellent. I think, uh, yeah, you, you've been doing great with these interviews. It's, I, uh, I appreciate it's that. It's been quite a few interesting things to, to take note of. And, yeah, Absolutely. Great to see all these people that you've just been typing with on the internet. So. <laughs> yeah, yeah, no, the, the, the internet has been very good for that. So otherwise, I think we would not have been able to to have you know have contact with these people so um it's been uh it's been a good thing in, in that sense um so Ivar, for, for those that do not know about yourself or they don't know kind of your your hornbow experience just tell us a little bit of history about how you got into bow making um i know that you were mainly doing longbows a while ago and now it's more 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 into hornbows yeah mm. So, um, well, I made my first bow in 2005 um, as a result of thinking that I needed a hobby that was related to my, my archaeology uh, education. Um, and so then, yeah, I made one. It was very, well, um, it was great, basically. And, <laughs> and so there was more bows. And yeah, I was doing wood bows for most of the time until uh, Adam Kapowitz um, uh, printed his book. Um, and uh, from there, it was like would the you, focus would you, was would, on the would, would you say you were self-taught uh, bowyer in the beginning or did you have some advice from somewhere? Uh, there was a lot of these internet forums. Uh, there's the, the Primitive Archer and uh, Paleo planets, um, and we also have a Norwegian forum actually um, for just bow makers, or well, mainly bow makers, uh, which has been very helpful actually. It's um, yeah, the the community is so so helpful in in like guiding. Them. Definitely, yeah, yeah, for sure. Um, is there a history of archery in Norway? Uh, like medieval times or anything like that. Is is there any history there? Um, you know, in your your previous um, uh, career of, as in archaeology, um, did you come across any any historical stories or information or artifacts about uh, you know archery in in Norway or that part of Europe? Yeah, for sure. Um, oh well. When it comes to archaeology, there isn't that much because the, these are wood bows and, and organic materials. They they don't preserve so easily. So um, um, we have like I don't know. I think there's two longbows and there's one bow from the Bronze Age. And uh, um, well, the Bronze Age bow was discovered in 2011. It's like fully preserved an elm bow, and then there's a U longbow from uh, from the Viking uh, ship burial uh, called the Goxta. Um, it's just a half bow, but uh, <laughs> uh, um, and then there is one from the migration period in further north in Norway, uh, also a U longbow. And also there is a, a lot of um, which I brought my, my master's thesis on. Um, on these uh, uh, Sami two wood bows. And uh, there's like 85 small fragments of them, I think, in total, maybe. Mm -hmm. um, May, so, maybe, 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 maybe that has been useful in, um, you know, sometimes when, when they dig up old bows and you can see the cross section, it gives you an insight into what they're made of and, and how they've been put together, right? Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and, and so, um, Looking, studying at these, uh, studying these objects is, is very helpful in, in kind of learn, learning the craft also, um, sure. seeing how they did it in the old right. days. Because mm -hmm. um, that's kind of my main method in all, all of this bow making that 
looking at the old artifacts is um, well, you're you're uh, you're kind of leaning on on hundreds of years of experience. Um, all of the shapes are kind of fine tuned to towards what worked back then. So I don't and see that there's any you know, there's no reason to be um, to kind of to invent something new because it's right. all been done before. Right, right. So you mentioned uh, Adam's book. When, when that book came out, you, you probably read that cover to cover many times. Um, <laughs> tell us about the influence and the time that you had um, and the conversation, communication you had with Adam and how he helped you. Oh, uh, well, um, well, I forgot to, to mention the, the ATARN forum, of course, which was super helpful uh, for the composites. And uh, yeah, uh, Bede and Adam and Jack Farrell has also been very, very helpful in, uh, in like, uh, yeah, explaining, explaining the history and, and the construction and, and, and also answering questions. It's, uh, it's been really, really helpful, uh, all, of, all of these guys there. Excellent. W would you say you had more, um, I guess, mentoring or, or you spent more time speaking with Adam because it was specifically you were your interest was in, in the Turkish hornbows, or yeah, yeah. Well, mainly, mainly my interest in the hornbows has come from flight archery, because I was doing flight archery with uh, with wood bows before, and then of course the Turkish bows are, without doubt, the the most efficient design for the light arrows at least. So for for flight archery, it's the Turkish ones that that matter. Kind of. Sure. And, but uh, I have been trying not to, to bother Adam too much because <laughs> he's uh, he should be busy making his own bows and uh, yeah right, but, right. Uh, yeah we we had some conversations and uh, yeah excellent uh, excellent it can really help you yeah for sure but the book is the book is really awesome yeah is, he he, uh, he put he put so much uh, information in, into that book so I mean if if anyone that knows a little bit about bow making can pick that up and kind of you know, learn from, from the rest of, of that book. There's so much detail in there. Yeah, yeah. And, and it's truly, this is so difficult to, to put something, um, something manual into a book like that. I don't think that's such an easy task. Um, like this is very hands-on, but even so, it, it's very clear and, and yeah. And so, when people ask how do you make a hornbow, I usually say, "Well, get the book and <laughs> start from there. Read it a couple of times." And, sure. And yeah. Yeah. It's all there, basically. Yeah, yeah. It's, it's, and it's, and the good thing as well is, yeah, absolutely. And and the the technique the the techniques for making the Turkish ones is is just the same, like learning how to use the glue and. and making the laminate, laminates of horn and so on. It's all, the, the, the main construction is, is the same anyways. The shapes are different, of course, but. Uh. Sure, sure. So in your, in your journey of, of, of making horn bows and Turkish bows, um, what do you find are the obstacles or the more difficult parts of making a horn bow. I'm sure certain things are now quite easy. You've done maybe a couple of hundred bows by now and broken a lot of them and, and you've learned from many experiences. Um, you know, is every bow quite similar or is it very different? Oh, <laughs> well, this many at least, but um, I would say the most difficult is gluing the horn. I think Adam had the same answer actually. It's a, like horn is, it's so, the material itself is so compact and it's, it's very like smooth. So for the glue to get a good grip is this kind of difficult. Um, and so to the horn, delaminate. And it took me, I don't know, um, well I started in 2008 with a it was like the things were like learning uh, 
yeah, well, I was learning quickly <laughs> or slowly, and I don't know. But, uh, the, the learning curve was very steep anyway. Sure. Uh, um, but in the recent years, it's, yeah, it's, it's working fine. Excellent. Um, and um, we, we were speaking before about... Um, Apart from that, I mean... Yeah. Um, the, Go on, sorry. Oh, sure. Um, like, of course, the main thing that people should focus on when making a hornbow is getting the shapes right, I think. There's a lot of focus on, on what material you should use and what glue you should use. Important thing. Um, the, the flight bows I've been using, it's, uh, I have one here that it's, it's made from elm and with vertical grain, um, which isn't optimal at all, but even so, it, it's working great. Um, so if you get the shapes right, it's like, that's the, perhaps the, the main challenge. Sure. I guess. Now, the, 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 the Turkish bow has um, gone through uh, like an evolution process of change in terms of its shape. Um, you know, the, the older bows, maybe the, um, the, the Kassan area is not as pronounced, whereas the later ones, they, they are. So which uh, shape do you, do you prefer to go with? Um, I, am, I don't think that's fully true, I think. Okay, because, please, please um, correct me, yeah. I mean, there are, you, yeah, no, no, <laughs> uh, it, to some extent it's true because you have different versions at di different times. Right. But the, it's very, the changes are very small. Mm. The, like the Kazan is always there and the main difference is, is actually just in the tips. Um, right. And, and like small details in the shape. Um, you have in, in Tokapi in Istanbul, you have um, a so called Bayezid type uh, yeah. Turkish bow, mm -hmm. which is dated to 1460, I think. And mm -hmm. this one is almost similar to, to the ones that is made like in the, the late 1700s. Um, right. It's just like the tips, and of, there are some small details that are changing, but sure. the main construction is. is yeah, it's quite similar actually. It's quite of similar, course, yeah. You have, you have some, perhaps, you have some development towards um, these uh, dedicated flight bows that are a little bit later, that have more like this, um, uh, I don't know how to say it, but Hilal Kuram? Yeah. This uh, uh, moon shape or crescent shape. Yes. Um, and maybe the earlier ones are more like boat shape. Um, mm. But well, <laughs> it, it's a little strange because you'd wonder what was before the Turkish bow and which one was the like the, the parents of the, the Turkish bow. But right. I don't know. It's like right. the, it seems like the design hasn't changed much, at least until back until the 1460s, at least. Mm. So, mm. and uh, in 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 your opinion, like you said, for especially for for flight archery, the Turkish bow is the most efficient shape for that yeah. speed mm -hmm. yeah. yeah and and the main well the main feature is just the shortness of the bows that's mm -hmm. what makes them so fast mm -hmm. a shorter bow is faster than a longer bow basically yeah. um, and of course you have all the the reflex and i'd say like the in general looking at the old bows the turkish ones have definitely the highest craftsmanship yeah um like the, the construction is, is very like thought through and then it's very very difficult to, to see any way to to make anything better than than the old bows yes it's uh it's quite fascinating actually there, there's a, been a really a really high standard on the on the old bows uh, which is natural because you have these amazing records i think it's 846 meters the longest one so it, it's right <laughs> it's absolutely incredible. Yeah. no doubt it's real 
sure. you need a heavy, well-designed bow to, to do do something like that. So, mm. so if let's say I, I I want you to make me a bow which is forty-seven pounds, for example, um, how easy is it to to make a bow and and get it around about that weight? And are you measuring at 28 inch draw generally um, and what happens if you are making the bow and you know you're, 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 you're at the tillering process and you might go below that poundage is it a fact of okay you must start again or can you can you do something to, yeah. to get the weight back or what happens? yeah no pretty much the, if it's too low then then you've got to start a new one basically wow. right um it's with the wood bows, you can shorten the bows a little bit, and that brings up the weight. Yeah. Or you can heat treat them, but it can only do so much. And of course, with the horn bows, you cannot do that. So um, what I end up doing when I get a, a specific order is I, I make a couple of bows, two or three bows. And so there's a little bit bigger chance that one of them will, will land at the correct weight. Um, I don't seem to have any problem getting rid of the other bows, so I don't mind making a couple of extra. Right, and and are you measuring at twenty eight inches the draw weight? Uh, no, no, I, I I measure it at at the, the draw length that people want. Uh, okay, right. uh, but mainly that's twenty eight, I guess. But um, uh, and that's the standard, of course. But well, these bows are kind of you need to make them according to the orders so of course um, yeah. so so if you want to if you want to get to a certain poundage do you start with uh, you know do you make the, the limbs thicker and you're starting to shave them down until you get to your preferred poundage yeah to some extent you can do that but it's limited because you have the three layers there's sinew on the back end and wood in the middle and horn of course mm. on the belly so and then for I say a forty-seven pound bow, you might have like three millimeters each, or three point one something like that. And then you have three millimeter horn, or something like that. And then you cannot reduce it that much. Uh, then you have one millimeter down to two, and that's already too little basically. So um, the, and that that's, that's the difficult part making a horn bow compared to making a wooden bow. Because a wooden bow, you can just shave off as much as you want. And of course, it'll be lighter and lighter, but it, it doesn't harm the bow. But a horn bow... So... Um, yeah. <laughs> what <laughs> And the, that's the um, reason why I, I tend to make a few of these. Things. Sure, sure. What is the heaviest bow that you've made? I made a 140 pound bow a couple of years back uh, for uh, Okchula Vakti in, in Istanbul. Um, and, but it started out quite a lot heavier actually. Um, oh, okay. Because when you're, when you're at this high weight, the, uh, the relation between the thickness of the limbs and the, the, the draw weight of the bow, it's so, if you add a little bit of mm. thickness, um, um, <laughs> the weight goes up a lot, yeah. uh, so uh, it, it lands one hundred and forty, um, and that's basically. Um, you did, can see the difference, but it's did, just like a couple of millimeters. In did they order that for um, just for kind of the, the museum for show, or they're actually using that? They're using it. Yep, yep. They're using it in the flight flight tournaments. So it's wow. a yeah. It's <laughs> that's quite a um, that's quite a quite a, um, you know a, a prominent um, order. You know from 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 an establishment like Oksha Lavakvi to 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 get you to to commission you to make a bow is quite a quite a big achievement. They must obviously recognize your your skills because you know it. it if we take Turkey at the moment, there are, I guess, would you say there's a, res a resurgence of bow making now, traditional, even horn bow making, laminate bows. There's so many different people making them now. 
to different degrees. Um, why do you think that is, you know, say in the last five years or so, there's been quite a big resurgence of this? Uh, I don't know. Uh, I think some TV series has had a big influence, perhaps, in general for archery or historical archery. Sure, sure. Um, You're referring to the, the, the Ertoral series and, and other similar ones, yeah? Yeah, mm, yeah. 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 Mm. Uh, I don't know. Yeah, <laughs> it's great to see that it's growing, and it's been growing as well in Norway for, I mean, the latest like fifteen years. is It's been it's been good, absolutely. Excellent. Or as long as I've been in the game, it's been growing. So sure, sure. Are there? I mean, without maybe naming names, but I mean, are, are there bow makers that that you kind of respect? Um, maybe not just in Turkey, but I mean, kind of worldwide. Apart from obviously the established ones that we know, like Adam and, and these guys, maybe the younger generation, you know, your age, the newer guys coming up, um, are there a, a few that you kind of would respect their work? Yeah, yeah, absolutely, absolutely. Um, I, I, I shouldn't mention names because <laughs> I don't want to. I don't want to forget him. Forget anyone. No, of course. Uh, I, I would. I would like you to mention names, but yeah, we, we don't want to forget people, and um, we don't want to make it as if we're kind um, of promoting some and not others. But I mean, but but you would say that there are a number of good quality bow makers, you know, at, at the moment, right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. I mean, it's it's just a matter of taking a look at well, mainly sadly Facebook in these groups, Aton, and uh, we have a group called. The horn warriors and uh most of the guys are there um mm. and yeah what, what i hope is that people are gonna be uh, uh jumping on the flight shooting train <laughs> right and uh yeah and participating in that yeah. and it would be good to have some some competition mm. um and i think um yeah there there are a few who are going to sure to, uh, I, 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 I recently interviewed uh, from Taiwan. It was uh, Yuhua Zhang. You, you know him? Yeah. Mm. Yeah. Some yeah. of his bows are just, they look amazing. they like so small, so thin. Mm -hmm. The tips are really tiny, but he, 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 he makes them just exquisitely. And um, he's now looking to kind of, I guess, mass produce uh, horn bows. Yeah. But to make it more accessible for people, which I think, you know, in, in a way is a good thing. Yeah, absolutely. Oh, sure. But I think this is part of, like, kind of the only way that you can do it. Because if you're just making a couple of bows, that's fine as a hobby. But if you're going to live from it, then you need to make a lot. And like in the old days, I guess they made, a shop made 50 to 100 bows in a year, something like that, with a couple of people. And I think also perhaps to get to the level of, to get the right craftsmanship on each bow, you need to make a lot of them. Like shaping these bows, it's, they're kind of intricate. So if you're just doing a couple a year, then it's difficult to keep the level up. Um, Definitely, yeah, for sure. Um, from start to finish, you know, uh, gluing, drying, tillering, blah, 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 everything. Roughly, how long would it take to make uh, a Turkish bow? <laughs> That's a good question. Uh, I I don't know. I have been taking note of the time for each process of the step, and then I do ten at a time or something like that. Um, but I, I haven't gotten through all the processes. Some have said maybe like two, three, four weeks of efficient work, perhaps. Eight eight hours per day, maybe something like that, for one bow. I don't know. It's it's really difficult to see. Yeah, and I, it's probably it's probably not not a very fair question, but um, well, know, no. it's it, I guess like I'm, you say, it depends how 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 much you're working on it and things like that. But yeah, I mean, are are, are there parts of the of the process that you just have to wait? You know, you, there's nothing you can do, like you know, waiting for the glue to dry, waiting for yeah, everything yeah. to merge and, and, and fit together. There's, there's nothing exactly. you, can, you can't rush that, right? Well, you you can speed up the process, but you all you always have to have some 
waiting periods in between words. And that's why it's so difficult to, to calculate the time it takes because, well, it takes one to two years to make a ball like that uh, if you're going to do it properly. And, but you still, you're just spending maybe three, four weeks efficiently on it. And so there's a lot of waiting time in, in between. And so, yeah, I, I, I don't know. Uh, yeah, with a wooden bow, you can make one in a day with a long bow. Right. Then you start in the morning and you're finished in the evening. Right. Um, okay. And I, I, well, yeah. Uh, I, guess, I guess because I, of the components of a horn bow, it's, um, it's, it's the horn and the sinew. This is what kind of complicates things. Yeah, yeah, definitely. Mm. Like, uh, and maybe especially the sinew. And, um, mm. There is like the final drying time when the bow is kind of glued together and you just yeah. hang it on the wall and wait, wait half a year. <laughs> um, wow. There is some questions to how important that is, but mm. I think traditionally, I wonder if it's three years, they said, the, the bow should wow. cure. Yeah. After it was sort of finished, uh, before you open it up. When um, when you're when you are making your 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 bows, do you have to label each one so that you remember how long it's been drying for or curing, in case you forget? Yeah, right? yeah, 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 absolutely. It's a, <laughs> and my shop, it's a total chaos. So uh, <laughs> um, definitely need some labels and uh, yeah, some notes. I can imagine. Um, okay, let's take a look at a couple of things you 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 brought to show um, yep. on, your, on your desk there and just uh, talk us through what you have. Yeah, well, um, what, how should I start? Um, I think either I you, can, the... you, you can switch the camera maybe if it's easier so yep. that you can move the yep. phone and, and show us what's what maybe. Mm -hmm. Yep, well, as a, as a well, um, well, let me start the story in, in 2016. Um, there was a, a guy who had a big archery collection. Uh, his name was Carl Zeilinger. And uh, he sadly wasn't able to donate his collection before he died. Um, and uh, so all of the collection ended up in a, at an auction. And I was lucky to, to get hold of some, some original arrows and, and bows. And those have been really really helpful for me in, in making um, well my Turkish equipment basically um, being able to, to study the arrows and the bows up close is, is so valuable in getting measurements and, and seeing the shapes and so um, I, I have brought out some arrows and two bows and um, see if we can, uh, we can manage this here and turn the camera here, I think. Okay, so um, let me see. Here is a lineup of some arrows, various arrows. Um, and this one is mine. It's made from, uh, it's basically modeled after this one, which is an original uh, uh, Turkish flight arrow. And it's got uh, paper veins. Made out of paper, <laughs> um, and uh, yeah, all of the all of these um, flight arrows they're quite standardized. They're generally like in in the. I don't know if this camera is focusing. By the way, is it? Um. um yeah. Can kind of well. <laughs> it looks blurry it, from this view, but I don't know. Slightly, but yeah, no, I can see the tips. Yeah. Okay. Anyways, <laughs> the, the tips are, they're bone tips. Maybe some of them are ivory, I don't know. Um, and uh, they're generally, just behind the, just behind the points, they're uh, three millimeters approximately, or 2.7 generally. And a little bit behind the middle, they're like 6.9 millimeters until, until the end here. They're, uh, well, I can illustrate on this, like just in front of the fletchings, they're like 4.7, maybe something like that. Uh, so they're they're really skinny. They're like uh, the minimum you can you can use. Uh, like in, when you shoot these arrows, they're all just like a spaghetti because they're so so flexible and thin. Um, and that's well, let me see. 
how to say it. Um, uh, uh, well, all of the materials in the arrows are kind of working just the same as in a bow. Um, they are, yeah, they're reduced to the bare minimum, basically, <laughs> just to, to get the weight down because these arrows are the, the, the flight arrows, they're just like below 200 grains for the whole arrow when we're shooting. I mean, a normal field point is like 125 grains, but these are the complete arrow is it's 200 grains. Um, so what, what, what type of bows, what type of poundage can you use on these arrows? Uh, that's very, that's difficult to say, but mm. I mean, from what I've seen, uh, these arrows are so standardized. To, to be able to be shot with these arrows. Um, and so you do have to use a very heavy bow for that. And I don't know, 120 perhaps? Um, it, it, it would be really interesting to see some of the, um, if they're preserved, see, them all, see some of the arrows that have actually been shot as records. Um, I mean, the, the shot of 846, it would be good to, to, <laughs> to see that arrow, to compare it. But I don't know. These arrows are probably a little bit later, I guess, maybe the 1700s. Um, but I've been shooting uh, this one closest. It's been shooting the 566 meters. Also, th this yeah, and this that was, was from this was, the, this was um, from 2019, right? Last year. Yeah, yeah, that's right. Mm -hmm. Yep, um, and that's the um, that's a current world record in the so-called primitive complex composite. Um, they have uh, they have classes in in the United States which are they're named a little bit silly, but because there's nothing primitive about these bows, of course. But it's referring to the to the rules that state that you need natural materials in um, in the equipment. Yeah. So, ev so everything everything so in there has to be plants. everything has to be natural. You can't have any um, mm. any any kind of metal or anything no modern. Material, right? Yeah, yeah. Metal is allowed in the release in some of the classes, but um, but there's no like, uh, well, Kevlar or any of the synthetic materials. You, you need a, a natural material string, for example, and of course, in in both the arrows and and bows, it's only natural materials as well. I guess points are allowed to be to be steel as well or metal, but. <laughs> um, Anyways, so um, like the design of my flight arrow is basically it's just a copy of uh, of the of the old ones. This one they have these so-called uh, Buckham knocks. Again, I don't know if this is focused or not. I hope it is, but I don't see any way I can refocus it. Uh, yeah, um, it's um, not it's fully blurry. focused, but we can kind of see the the, the knocks. You can see the outline, yeah. perhaps. Yeah. <laughs> Anyways. Um, and uh, yeah, what to say? Uh, these uh, Buckham knocks, they're kind of perhaps you, this one. Let's see. Can I can I ask? Were these, uh, you know, were these artifacts expensive when you bought them? Were they were they quite quite a lot or, or reasonable? Uh, it's um, I don't know. It was kind of a once in a lifetime opportunity, I guess. I mean, I haven't seen any like this on the market like after sure sure and uh i don't know if the prices i paid if that was representative or not mm. i thought it was quite cheap right but, um i have i have bought one arrow uh afterwards which was from the same collection and this is the this the green one here which is yeah. um it's a whistling arrow yeah uh, and i paid i think i paid 400 euros for it um, which is a lot for an arrow, of course, but yeah. I don't know. I felt it was worth it. Yeah, yeah. Um, and I made some, I made some uh, copies of the the arrowhead and Excellent. tried it. Okay, great. Tell us, tell us about this. This second arrow from the top has these kind of little spikes. Um, it oh yeah, really yeah. Different. This is a. Uh, if anyone listening is, uh, you can see this arrow here. Um, 
it has these spikes and like what was the use of this i mean you couldn't really shoot it <laughs> i would think or maybe you could it is definitely a turkish arrow because the the knock and uh and the fletchings is a typical turkish um and is yeah well not much left of the fletchings but usually these don't have any fletchings at all mm. they're eat quickly it's got I, a, I wonder if the little spot. um the the spikes were used as kind of to you know, cause more pain or something if, if it went into <laughs> a person or something. yeah I, I don't know if we can only guess yeah I, i've been thinking maybe it was like um a, an arrow to test your technique in some way or to challenge someone because it would require i mean i don't know if it's possible to shoot it at all and not ripping up your hand um but perhaps with the right amount of katra you could perhaps shoot it without like touching the bow and touching the bow hand right yeah possibly yeah um, the, the, the the shaft itself it has been shot uh, because mm. there is a splice here at the uh, at the front. Right. It's just a uh, the standard type of splice. I don't know what how to dis how to I don't know what word it has, but mm. it's just a it's just a cut kind of at one angle. Right. They're just two pieces glued together. I see. Um, but I, I I would suspect that these spikes have been added later. So it's been an old target arrow, mm. perhaps, and then. It's been broken and repaired, and then added these spikes. Yeah, yeah but right. it's a really strange one. I haven't seen anything like it before. So, uh, mm. if anyone would have some suggestions, I'd be happy mm -hmm. to take them. Yeah, um, excellent. And um, we were talking a little bit about the quality of these things. Mm. It's uh, like the top one uh, is just amazing. You can see it's shiny, but the <laughs> that's not so important. But it's uh, it's made from bamboo, and it's uh, oh, this sort of right. split cane construction. Right. right. So there's seven seven pieces of uh, bamboo that's glued together, so that you can get this uh, barrel shape. Because all of the 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 Turkish arrows are barreled, or pretty much all, I guess, to some extent at least. But like the the workmanship of these is just amazing. These were absolutely expensive arrows originally for sure um yeah the i don't know how many looks arrows amazing. Do. looks amazing yeah yeah this one i don't know what the use was as well it's um the point is strange there's no hole in it it's not a whistling arrow like the green one um and it's really thick i think maybe it's nine millimeters in the middle um and it's got this uh yeah ivory knock yeah beautiful very very nicely made you had some bows as, as well there right yeah yeah let me see it's, ah, it's good to i guess oh there we go get the gloves on not not because yeah. of, not because of covid but because they're, <laughs> they're antiques <laughs> yeah i have some places where i touch these uh, wrapping there to uh, yeah to move it when holding or holding it there um, and so yeah this is an old Turkish flight bow um, was also in the, the the collection of Karl, Karl Zeilinger um, and this has been really really helpful in uh, um, in, in making these bows to be able to to study it study it up close and and get the, the shape and the dimensions this one has a made um that's not lightweight perhaps isn't it? <laughs> to today's standards but uh um yeah and it's uncovered it this has been just raw basically there's no leather or paint on this one let me see if I can turn around a little bit, perhaps get a better view of this. And this, where you were mentioning the the Kassans and and the, the flight bows, they generally have a kind of a not so sharp transition into the into Kassan. Um, 
and usually in in the middle of the picture now there is a, a signature and a date on the, the signature on one kazan and the date on the other but there is something written on this one but i haven't been able to to take a good picture of it for anyone to to read it i couldn't read it of course but um anyway so this is like the ah uh, this is a so-called sec type um and uh, the definition of that is that the the back of the bow is is convex. Usually, the other the standard Turkish bows are are flat on the, the back, um, but these have the the sinew a little bit rounded on the, the back. And that's the purpose of that is to to make the um, make the limbs thicker without raising the draw weight so much. And a thicker limb is, is faster than a, than a thinner. And so this is sort of maximized for efficiency, basic, basically, or speed, rather. Right. So, yeah. So, and, and so this is, this, is a, this is not a target bow. This is a flight bow. Yeah, this is a dedicated flight bow. This right. is uh, Amazing. And, and it was not covered, probably, because it was, uh, it was like... Um, not a one-time use, of course, but it, yeah. it, it, there's a big risk in shooting these bows, and, and they might break and so mm. on. And so I think the, the dedicated flight bows are generally not covered. Um, right. Um, I mean, you have plenty of these fantastically nicely decorated Turkish bows, and the amount of work going into the decoration is just as much as making the bow itself. Of course, yeah, absolutely. And so you wouldn't want to do that on, on a bow that might break just for, for a couple of shots. That said, I have so far not broken a single flight bow. Um, so uh, I think they're... That's amazing. They're that's, quite, that's quite an achievement. <laughs> I don't know. I'm using them quite a lot, so I'm, I'm quite impressed. I have a video. Uh, of the shooting in Utah, and I broke several. Well, I broke all of the strings basically <laughs> uh, because of the natural material requirement for the strings. Um, and all of the bows survived, even though they, the strings broke like I don't know five or six times per uh, per round. So they're quite quite durable. But of course, you can see this one a wrapping, just some uh, some string that's been wrapped around. It's probably started to, to delaminate, to delaminate, and uh, yeah, you can sort of save it, I guess, with a, a wrapping like that. But also, it's interesting uh, how small um, you would cover the whole thing with your hand, basically. Um, but of course, these bows are made to to be shot with the the sipo. Um, I don't know. I don't think I can handle both of these together. But I mean, you have the the sipoch and the bow and yeah you hold it in a in a special way i can show with a one of my bows perhaps um anyways that's a the the small grip on these bows is kind of a typical for the flight bows uh the the target bows and the war bows generally have a much bigger grip they're both well bigger i should say they're thicker in this way and, and a little bit longer as well yeah and uh yeah, well, interesting. Do Do you have any idea what age this bow is, is, is from? No, sadly not. Uh, I really wish that it would be possible to to see the the date. It says here <laughs> in the middle, like here it says, but it's it's really blurry. Uh, yeah. I have taken pictures of it and I sent it to a few guys who could read it if it was vis visible, but. Um, it's, uh, I think, hopefully someday I will have someone here to, to look at it directly and maybe they could read it. But Because um, I'm sure it says on the bow. <laughs> uh, but I would guess it's from the 1700s, uh, approximately. The shape is sort of indicating that anyway. So, um, but I have another one. Let me just put this back. Um, I have another one here that's dated, which is sort of also a, 
a flight bow. This one, um, I'm not sure. I think that's the date, perhaps. Yeah, that's the date. Mm -hmm. It says. Um, and this is more of a. Uh, well, I don't know what to say. I think it's a flight bow as well. Right. It's covered in in birch bark, or uh -huh. most of the bark has gone now. But right. it has been fully the, the, covered. This this particular shape, like you said before, looks more like a boat shape rather than like a a hilal yes, moon that's shape, true. right? That's true. Yeah, yeah. Um, well, this one, if I can show the whole whole thing. Um, this side has been uh, has been damaged and it has had the the horn replaced. Okay. And uh, yeah, it it doesn't look um, so symmetrical. This is the yeah yeah yeah. Mm -hmm. But this one is is uh, the original shape. Um, and it's yeah, it's more like a boat shape sort of. Even though you can be fooled by the sort of the string follow that you get, mm. and because these bows are so flexible that um, how to say. Like the shape that you make them with is not the same as they end up with. So if you took if you made a bow that had this shape when you made it, it wouldn't end up with this shape. It would it would deform when you throughout the making kind of. So you would end up with a bow that looked different. Um, I don't know how to just like how to explain that. But. Sure. Yeah. yeah Anyways, yeah. here's yeah. there's a detail that's quite interesting. I think. Uh -huh. um you see there's no wrapping underneath the knock right. there's just this uh, leather leather pr protection there mm -hmm. and um, i've tried it on a, on a few bows and it works it, oh, you don't really? need, need okay. a wrapping yeah yeah it was uh, th that's the thing that you should just trust the old guys because right. they knew how to do it yes um there's, there's no need to to invent anything new here <laughs> yeah the, the, the wrapping was, of... was 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 normally done with sinew right there's two to strengthen the yeah. tip. Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah. Because mm. on some some bows, on some war bows, you have a you have a sinew wrapping just underneath mm -hmm. here, and then you have in addition the the leather. Um, um, right. So I think the uh, let's see, go over here, and this this flight bow has just uh -huh. the sinew wrapping. Right. It, this one has had the, the tip that has come off actually, and it's been a repaired with uh, this red see. string. But yeah, but this this wrapping of sinew is very common on these. Um, so, well, and the black stuff on the side here that's leather. So it has it's covered with a yeah with leather on the sides and then birch bark on the back. Uh huh. It's not so well preserved, but that's, I don't mind that. <laughs> it's a. Uh, oh. Yeah, it looks very nice. Yeah, but it's, it's amazing that it's still in, uh, still in such, you know, good condition. And, and I guess, like you say, you've, you've been able to use it as a, a template for. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Yeah. It's a, it's been a really good teacher to, mm. to, to make some copies of this. Yeah. Um, I, I, can, I, can, I can imagine the bows were also, you know, reach not, 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 not that cheap, right? When you, when you got them. Uh, yeah, I, I hesitate to, to mention anything, but <laughs> <laughs> um, yeah. uh, I, the, the prices are actually, they're available online. Sure. So anyone, anyone could figure it out, I think. Yeah. So I, for this one, I think I paid 1700 euros for which oh, I think is, is super I thought I thought it would have been much more than that. That's actually quite, yeah. quite a very good price. Yeah. Yeah, but but the the prices at the, at this uh, specific auction was quite low. I think. Right. Right. Um, right. And so, anyways, I yeah, I felt quite lucky to be honest. For sure. Um, anyways, yeah. There is kind of the the result of of copying. <laughs> yeah. Um, this one I made. Um, how do you um, just exactly. if you just go back to the to the leather part on the tip there um yeah how is that one piece of leather and if so yes. how do you manage to get it to cover all the different angles and areas do you have to heat it or something yeah yeah what you do is you put it in in glue and uh and heat it up in the glue so hide glue that is uh, and then it's just a matter of, of pushing it in there and then just continually pushing it into the, the knock and uh, eventually it'll stay there 
and once it's dry it's just like i don't know how, how to describe it but it, it ends up being kind of like a hard plastic yes right right, so right. It, it's really like it's really durable and, and strong actually excellent okay great and then and then uh, I shape it afterwards. So I just put it on a, a big blob and then, then use a file afterwards to, to shape it down. I see. But it, it I takes see. a lot of time, actually. Uh -huh. But um, so, well, I think it looks nice. Yeah, it definitely looks very neat, very nice for sure. <clears throat> and uh, well, um, while we're at the table, perhaps we can um, have a look at. Uh, at a SIPO as well. Yes, of course. Yeah. There is a, there's a, an old one. And I, well, again, just trying to copy it as, as far as I, as far as I could. Um, and on these things, there are so many different angles and, and shapes that are like, um, how to say it, it's, uh, it's well thought out. So having these originals to look at is, is so uh, so help, helpful because I was struggling a lot making a, a good SIPO and getting it to, to function right. But um, if you have something that's well thought out from, from the old days, then it, it, uh, it works well. Um, and so I'm I'm really happy with this one. This is my I don't know fourth attempt, I guess. Yeah, yeah, excellent. Um, and, but this one works really well. Mm -hmm. What's difficult is is getting like I don't know, like the angle according to the hand. Get yes, that right. Yes, that's very difficult. Um, and this one, the original, has this. A little, it's a little bit unusual actually, mm. in that you see. I don't know, I don't know the names here, but but this part, this is wood that's covered with yeah, leather. Right. <clears throat> um, and this this is very tall on this one, mm. or on, on these rather. But that I think that works very well. I think some of them are really um, not so tall, and that mm. means that you have to you have to hold the hand really far forward. I see. Uh, well, this yeah. one you can you can hold your hand a little bit more normally. S straight. Yeah. 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 Um, is the, is the leather just glued onto that wooden block, or is it? Yeah, is it yeah, it's gonna... just uh, it's just like a zero point three millimeter thick leather mm. um, that's glued on straight on the wood, I mm -hmm. guess. Mm -hmm. um, and then, of course, it's got this uh, this uh, stingray fish fish leather on top. <laughs> yeah. Stingray, it's stingray skin has it's been um, it's been quite a it's it's featured in a number of other bows. They they cover the bow in this stingray skin. Is that because it's quite thin and yeah. and it can flex? Yeah, yeah, and it's it's very like um, abrasive resistant. Because um, actually, when you if you sand this stuff, it's uh, it smells just like bone. So these uh, things on it, it mm. it's actually a bone structure, I guess. Right, uh, and which is attached to to a, to a skin underneath, so it's really like durable. And I guess I mean that's what you would look be looking for for a, a sipo, something that's hard and but also um, flexible, so you can shape it. Um, but for safety, I mean, because uh, <laughs> this uh, tabla or this shield is there in case the arrow would fall out of the groove, and and you would. You would shoot yourself in the hand, and sure. unless it wasn't there. So, of course, um, I guess that's why they used it. Yeah. Of course, you have you have many other materials on the original ones. But, uh, so your your one white one is is what is the platform made out of, and and underneath what is that made from? It's uh, it's uh, well in the middle there is uh, there is maple, uh, just wood, mm -hmm. and. Um, and this is just bone. I think uh -huh. I think I used the leg bone from camel. I think mm. um, some camel leg bones are, are just big enough for that. Yeah. And uh, yeah, yeah. Otherwise, it looks uh, it's leather. Looks, looks but it, it really. 
well i don't know it's uh but the shape is really good i think because it, it fits my hand well and and i'm over, always uh what they say overbowed when i do a flight archery so right. it's i'm always on the limit of what i can pull yeah and and managing to to hold um to get all the pressure just uh get all the pressure just in between the uh -huh. thumb and the index finger yes because that's where the main pressure from the bow comes sure that's uh like that that's the challenge yeah <laughs> um so uh, excellent well I, I there are, yeah uh, I, I, I hmm? see there's a, um, you have a thumb ring there as well, a, 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 a yeah. ivory or bone hmm. thumb ring. I yeah. guess you made that one as well. Yeah, sure, sure. Um, it's, uh, well, this is not a copy or a replica, or, but it's inspired by, I guess, I mean, looking at pictures from the internet and <laughs> it's, uh, it, this shape, I think, was the shape that was used for flight archery because you have some thumb rings, Turkish thumb rings that are more like um, round, I guess. Uh, well, some have this very steep angle. Um, yes, so when that, that's quite steep. Yeah. So, uh, so like when the string falls off the, the edge here, it just clears away right away. Kind of. um, and then I have this leather thing just glued to it. Just so, well, because my fingers are soft and gentle. <laughs> mm -hmm. Anyways, but this is bone. Um, right. Very nice. Um, mm -hmm. it, works, it works nice. Yeah. yeah. Like, like I said, that the, for my my challenge is uh, getting the pressure on the hand between the the thumb and the index finger from the bow, and and also the the thumb drawing the string is like that's my limitation. So having a Having both a sepo and a thumb ring as well is, is so important. Um, uh, which is, I have some other items here which, which you can have a look at at the same time maybe, uh, which are not historical at all, but they're allowed to be used in, um, in the uh, um, classes in the US where you have this uh, primitive complex composite class. For just for flight archery uh, and the primitive refers to the all natural materials and complex composite means that you can just make up any type of bow you want out of natural materials right and right. so these are just uh yeah inspired by by random things <laughs> uh, well i had a lot of help with this one uh from alan case uh, uh -huh. this is sort of a it's a so-called hook hook and loop release yeah it, it looks like a primeval uh, um, uh, um, compound release or something yeah yeah absolutely mm. so what you do is you just take this thread and you hook it around the string yeah. and then you put it on top of this loop uh -huh. or this uh, this peg there yeah and then what you do is you just tilt this whole thing forward ah, and then okay, this then comes off. right excellent and, yeah. uh, so so you get a really clean release with this one wow. uh, or it's it's kind of controllable with the thumb ring you you need to practice a lot to get a mm. good release mm -hmm. but with this one it's uh you just do it and <laughs> yeah sure and um and as well when i was shooting in last september in, in utah i used this kind of ugly contraption which right. is just a piece, piece of a uh, piece of uh, buffalo horn yeah and it's like an overdraw that i just this part okay let me let me just uh, move this old bow here uh, let me show you on, a, on my own this this one we can mess around with um of course now i have the the mushama on this one uh, okay, so let me turn around. Yeah, please, please explain that as well. How that works? Oh, let me see. Yeah. <laughs> Sorry, I'm making I'm making you do it one-handed. So, um, um, yeah, no, 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 no worries. Oh, okay. So, <laughs> anyways, it, it slides uh, into there. Yeah, sort of. Uh, it's not possible to slide it into there, but yeah. this would go just 
uh, underneath the mushama. Uh-huh. And uh, just wrapped it uh, on the the bow handle like that. Right. And because in in this uh, primitive complex composite category, you are allowed to have a four inch overdraw. Uh-huh. And so the distance the distance from the back of the bow. Yeah. And then four inches behind, so the arrow can can then be uh, be drawn like. Um, right, and you have this overdraw to make sure it all goes safely. <laughs> and I just made this uh, f- small feather rest and uh, a leather stop, just to as four inches is sort of that distance there. Um, okay, right. Yeah, anyway, excellent. <laughs> so, so the the I used so okay in in. Um, in Utah again, uh, in the Turkish class, then of course you need to use a thumb ring and sure. the zipper. Yeah. But in the primitive compos- composite, you can use these things, and it's a little bit easier uh, with this. I would. Say. And 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 with these, you you actually um, you you achieved an excellent record of of, of four, um, coming first in in four different categories. You mentioned. Yeah, that's right. Mm, yeah, there it was a little crazy. Yeah. <laughs> I don't know how it happened, but uh, I had a lot of luck, and the weather was was great that weekend. Um, so the best result I got was this five hundred and sixty six point eighty eight no but in point eighty three and it was just thirty three uh thirty three centimeters behind the the previous right record let me see I have no it's uh it's this thing here. Uh-huh. Yeah, not yeah. so clear. Anyways, uh, yeah. So uh, <laughs> it's a little funny it's, uh, record. Um, Harry Drake. He holds and held a lot of. Uh, for some reason, I managed to shoot. 33 centimeters beyond that. Um, anyways. Yeah, that's an amazing achievement. Well but done. But there is still, but but there is still a lot to go on. It's uh, those 800 plus meters is uh, <laughs> the. Well, I don't think I ever will manage that. That would be, uh, I would be too old when I suppose that can do that. <laughs> yeah. Excellent. Excellent. Although. Um, I think I think he has the shooting machine. I don't remember, but I think it's 793, I right. think. Wow. So anyway, he, he showed that it's possible to shoot this far anyway with uh, with uh, original type equipment. Mm. Yeah, there was a video that Adam showed me of a, a, a shooting machine he had. Um, yeah. Mm-hmm. So, yeah, that was that was amazing. Uh, <laughs> it was really cool to see that. It was the first time I saw it in, in your uh, in your interview. Okay, excellent. Very interesting. It was really very interesting. So, what, what about? I mean, presumably, obviously, you you make your own arrows as well. Do you have different sets of arrows for for different bows, or is it mainly flat arrows that you make? Oh well, I try to make anything pretty much uh anything historical but um yeah yeah what should i say i mean for the for the original turkish equipment you have so many different types of arrows and they all have their different purposes um and i don't know this as well as i should but i mean you have the 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 type of uh competition arrows flight yeah. arrows yeah and then you have the the, the the other training arrows for yeah for training for the competition basically right um and i guess like this oh i should say because i don't know this <laughs> uh this one with the the spiral wrapping that's yeah a, uh, uh type um for like when you have the the fletchings wrapped around like this, they don't, 
fire the arrow, they just break or they just like slow down the arrow. Um, so if you did anything wrong in the release, you will see that the arrow is, is wobbling side to side or up and down. And so I guess that was perhaps the main use for it to, to check your technique. But yeah, I, I try to, uh, well, my main interest is, is copying the old stuff basically and, and learning yeah. from, from the old makers. Sure. Uh, I don't sure. have any interest in, in trying to invent something myself. Sure. Apart from these modern things, but that's that's just tools for. Yeah, uh, absolutely. Yeah. <laughs> uh, no, you've 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 really done an excellent job with with that. Um, what I wanted to just do before we maybe finish, I'm going to just share my screen. Um, you can maybe turn your camera yeah. around. I'm just going to show people the um, the Instagram page you have and your YouTube. So. Um, this is Ivar's uh, Instagram page. Um, I'm not going to try and pronounce the uh, the address of it, but people can see it here. Um, some excellent pictures of of of, of bows that he's been making, uh, crab bows, Turkish bows, um, even some some kind of just straighter long bows and things like that. I think there's a Scythian there. Mm -hmm. um, it's uh, a Korean, actually. Ah, I'm sorry. You're right. Yeah, Korean. No, yeah, no. it's a very be beautiful shape. Beautiful shape. The, yeah, the, the, I, paint, I did. The, the painting on your bows is that done by yourself or someone else? Yeah, yeah. The blue one is is my my work. Really? Um, wow. But it's um, amazing. Yeah, it, it's it's okay. I've been looking at quite a few original bows, and while some of them are just absolutely amazing. Uh, some of them are more like this one. <laughs> yeah, but uh, do, do you have to, I mean, you have, you can't just paint a bow and it comes out like that. You have to know a little bit about the type of paint that you need and, and lacquer and things like that, right? Yeah, no, sure. This is, uh, oh, it's so difficult, I have to say. It's, it's, I've been focusing on this for the last year, maybe. And uh, yeah, it, it's, it's a big job, really. And to get all the layers right and to sure. to get adhe adhesion between the layers sure. this was a, this one is an old one though but sure. um mm -mm -mm. so there is just as much challenge in decorating these bows as it is in in just making them yeah i can imagine i can imagine um there was a uh there was another one that's part of the game i guess it's the, the challenge <laughs> of the whole yeah. thing is, uh, but i didn't make this one i should say this one was just a, a repair this is one is uh, made in Korea, but I, right. I exchanged the horn on one side. Wow. Okay, that's a Korean hornbow. Amazing. Yep. You can yep. see the lovely curves on there. Um, what, yeah. what, what, what do you think about, I mean, Korean bows also are, are, are quite um, very fast and, and a little bit harder to handle. Do you, are they also good for, for flight archery, would you say? Because the Koreans, they shoot normally quite far anyway. Yeah. Yeah, this is a question I don't know the answer to. Um, it's um, uh, for one thing, just looking at them, they have a little bit wider tips, mm -hmm. while the Turkish ones have more narrow and thick ones. Mm. And that is usually an indication that they're not that good for light arrows. Even so, uh. the, the Korean ones are quite short and they have lots and lots of reflex. Mm. And uh, so they're definitely fast. Sure. I don't know if I think probably they would they would excel at medium weight arrows. Mm. Um, I haven't seen any results like flight shooting results from a, from a Korean bow, right? From a, like a heavy a heavy comparable Korean flight bow. Uh, yeah, maybe but, there's but something that someone could do. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I would definitely like to see someone like push that design a little bit that would be really sure. cool um, yeah. to, see, to see how well a, a 90 pounds korean would do definitely. compared to a turkish definitely these are just some uh, some air, flight arrows they're uh, got yeah. the, the buckam type nox glued <laughs> uh, uh okay so yeah. that's glued onto the top and then you file it down to make the self exactly or something. yes right, yes right, right. Yep. Yep. so there's two pieces of wood of hardwood Got you. Right. Just because if you would just 
use the wood of the shafts for the knocks, mm -hmm. the, the knocks would just break because they're they're so finely shaped. Yes, right. Um, is it difficult uh, to to find the correct um, uh, kind of spine and 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 um, quality of of grain for for wooden arrows because some of them might have um, bumps in or or imperfections or things like that. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. And especially for the flight arrows. But what I do is I, I just buy regular uh, shafts, arrow shafts, um, and then make the flight arrows from that. Because if you're going to take a tree from the far, forests and make shafts, it's, um, well, 90% of those won't be good for flights. So right you need a you need a big forest to choose from yeah where where, do, where um, do you source your your wood for your arrows oh um there's quite a few uh this um Tals company is good mm -hmm. they make good pine arrows mm. and uh bear is selling their spruce arrows which are also good uh -huh. so for, for flights is uh those two are spruce right. and, and pine yeah. is, is the yeah. best you know so, and there you so, see the, the shape of the buckam knot. Yes, by the this way. is the finished product. It looks it looks beautiful. Yeah, really nice. It, I, it, it, looks, it, it looks as if it's part of the arrow, but obviously it's not. It's it's been glued on and, and filed in. Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah. Mm -hmm. I will not say thank you because it's not my shape. It's uh, I'm just <laughs> copying. So <laughs> right. <laughs> it's uh, copy and paste. Well, and it well, works. well, well. Thank you for copying. <laughs> Yeah, well, I enjoy it. <laughs> yeah, that's good. So, yeah, I mean, oh, look, amazing. Uh, a bone this arrow. Is, uh, this is actually, wow. Yeah, this is from an original from Norway. It's dated to around 550. Um, amazing. Back then, back then, iron was too expensive, so they, they also used bone. Yeah, tips. yeah. Bone, bone can, just, can be just as, as effective sometimes. Yeah, yeah, it's not as durable, but it it can. Yeah, yeah, I'm sure it works. Amazing. So this is and the th boat that one, you showed us. Yeah, yeah, this is one I had on the table here actually. Excellent. Um, right. It's it's um, a 57 pound bow. Uh, I used it in the 70 pound category in mm. Utah, and mm. it shot let me see, 452 meters. Amazing! Wow, awesome. So that is. Um, Ivar's uh, Instagram page, we'd like people to try and check that out. And then just briefly, his, uh, his YouTube page. Um, I was looking at this video earlier. So it's Ivar Malde as his name. And a lot of um, very useful short videos about, um, actually, let me just go there, about um, bow testing, slow motion videos, um, strings coming off while he's shooting um his his uh experiences at the uh the utah shoot in 2019 um so i just go to video so he's got a number of videos that he's showing some of the slow motion ones were quite interesting about you know you said that mm -hmm. you kind of you broke about 20 20 strings but the the, the bow yeah. fortunately didn't um didn't break it it, it, it withstood the uh, yeah. testing, yeah, mm -hmm. which was which was good. Yep. Yep. What, what 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 do you think caused the strings to break? Uh, just my, my incompetence. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> they they were made too thin, basically. Right. Um, right. Next time, I'm going to make them a lot thicker. <laughs> right. 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 And you had you you had to obviously go and you had to go to Utah with all those spare strings uh, as yeah. extra supply. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And so I thought I was being smart and just making one string per arrow, basically. So oh, I see. <laughs> and uh, that that was a good idea, actually. Yeah. yeah. Because uh, I I used all of them, and uh, I even uh, ended up on on one of the evenings there making more strings. So, ah, right. Yeah. This was an even a very, the, this was an yeah. an amazing video. I mean, this arrow, three hundred and ten feet per second. Which is just yeah yeah crazy. sure it's, yeah but actually this is not the best I uh, I'm not sure if I have a video of that I don't think so but um, the best I have 
was published in in uh, in a German magazine, mm. Traditionelle Bogeschießen, and it was uh-huh. 374 feet per oh second. Oh my goodness me! Uh, and that was the same bow that I set this uh, 566 meter record. Oh wow! Awesome. It's probably if you click on the on the first video in the list. Yeah. I think it's that bow. It might be that that one ah, at least okay. the first one here. Yeah. Um. Yes, I think so. Yeah. Look at that. The string just came so right that, off there. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It just breaks right at brace height. Wow. It's, um, this is yeah. another and I, I was really surprised that the bows held up. Mm. Um, because, well, it basically means that you can brace the bow and then you wow. can just cut the string and the bow will survive. Right. Um, yeah. But the horn is, is under quite a bit of tension there. So. Mm. <laughs> uh, it's uh, quite amazing that it can go from all that stress to releasing the stress in a split second and, and not, um, mm-hmm. not break. Yeah. Yeah. Awesome. Excellent. I was quite happy about that. <laughs> no, that's good. That's good. That's Excellent. Good. Um, good luck there. definitely. Um, but, uh, Ivar, it's been a, a, a real honor for me to, to finally speak with you. And, and I appreciate all of the, uh, the time you've given us and showing us some of your, your work and i know that you know you, you you're still on that journey of improving and, and always developing and trying to um you know master the the art that you're doing so um you know from i guess the archery community are grateful to you for you know dedicating your life to that now because um you know while we do look um to the older generation that the adam karpowitz and and these guys uh who have paved the way um it's it's um it's only useful to have a path if people are going to follow that path so um the fact that you are um taking it upon yourself and dedicating this yourself to this craft is is really good so we'd like to thank you for for your time and your your dedication to that and uh we hope that whoever sees this video will connect with you online and maybe put in some orders and because that will help you to the more bows you can make, the more you can learn, the more you, mistakes you make, and except the more you can refine your skill. So, um, so we, yeah, we hope sure. that happens. But um, yeah, I'll, I'll, I'll leave you the last word to finish in this conversation. <laughs> well, what can I say? It's, uh, thank you for the opportunity. And uh, yeah, thank you for doing this. It's been really interesting to see, uh, see all of the other interviews. And yeah, it's, it's great to, to get some faces and some some conversation going on it's uh yeah i think we can all learn from each other 100 percent, 100 percent. excellent uh, thank you very much well we'll we will definitely stay in touch on uh on social media etc and uh any any yeah. other big developments that was happening then uh let us know and maybe we'll do a part two or something sure sure mm. it's possible <laughs> <laughs> Excellent, mm-hmm. excellent. Okay, you have a good night, Ivar. Thank you very much for your time. You too. Thank you. Speak to you soon. All right. See thank you. you. All right. Bye. <laughs>